Hello everybody, I'm some loudmouth on the internet with an opinion. As you may have just seen, I have now discovered that I am a bouncer. No, not that kind of bouncer. I mean, I discovered I was born with the magical ability to teleport myself and other things across anywhere on the planet in the blink of an eye. With these powers, I could help rescue people on stranded ships or help global transportation. I could even uh, show scientists about it so that they could replicate the ability to help end the energy crisis. But instead, I'm going to teleport myself some snacks. What? You think I should be doing something better with my powers, don't you? Well, why should I when a major Hollywood movie tells me that I should do absolutely nothing with them but help myself? I'm, of course, talking about the douchebag manifesto we know as Jumper. You know those garbage, lowest common denominator programs like Entourage, Jersey Shore, Real House Bitches of whatever, who the fuck cares county? You know the shows that sociopathic losers watch in order to live vicariously through the low lifes on screen? Well, since these pieces of crap somehow find enough people who enjoy tasteless crap to stay on the air, Hollywood decided to get on the act and appeal to these folks with a big budget superpower movie. The result was Jumper. This movie is about people with the ability to teleport themselves and others at will, which they call Jumper. An interesting power that might have made a cool movie with interesting characters and backstory, but instead we get this piece of trash. It's stupid, it's bland as hell, and it's incredibly mean-spirited. So what makes Jumper such an inspiration for me to sit on my ass while the world burns? Well, let's dig in and find out. So we open up with our main character David, played by a guy who doesn't like sand, in Egypt talking about how awesome his life is. Oh yeah, and I got digits from this Polish chicken Rio. And then I jumped back for the final quarter of the NBA Finals. Courtside, of course. And all that was before lunch. I could go on, but all I'm saying is, I'm standing on top of the world. Yeah, doesn't your life suck, you non-teleporting losers? It wasn't always like this. Once I was a normal person. This is before we flash back to David in high school, when he was an ordinary teenager doing what every horny teenager does, doing something stupid to impress a girl. All good, see? In doing so, he falls through the ice and is saved by activating his powers of teleportation for the first time. He teleports into the Ann Arbor Library and then goes home to meet his dad. You late? Where you been anyway? Hey, you know when I ask a question, I expect an answer, okay? Hey, hey, hey. What happened to you? Hey, uh, David, get back down here. Get a mop and clean this crap up. Yeah, how dare a father ask his teenage son what happened at school and to clean up a mess he made? Doesn't he know that making messes that we don't clean up is what our generation is all about? And that's when it occurred to me, this thing that just happened, it could set me free. He decides to abandon his father and everyone he knows in order to live off his powers. So there I was. I had a million questions. Like, how does this thing work? I was 15. Come on, what would you have done? But in order to join the Teen Douchebag Hall of Fame, David decides to rob a bank. I'm gonna need a bigger bag. Yeah, because nobody was using that money to pay their mortgage or save for their kids' college education or any stupid crap like that. It's time to introduce our main villain, Roland Cox, played by Sam Jackson, who runs an organization called the Paladins, who kill jumpers because... Why? Because you are an abomination. <laughs> Only God should have the power to be all places at all times. <laughs> In case you're wondering, yes, that is the entire motivation for why the Paladins hunt and kill jumpers. Because only God should have the power to be in all places at all times. Huh? What does that even mean? Who? What? Why? But back to good old David, he lives an awesome life on money he steals while he watches people drown to death that he could save in a few seconds. The question now, Pat, is what will happen to these peoples? It would take a miracle to get to them. What an asshole. 
Look, I am not against a movie having a totally unlikable jerk as your main protagonist. The problem is this movie doesn't satirize or criticize David's behavior. It glorifies it. Don't believe me? Watch the next scene. You see him rewarded for letting hundreds of innocent people die by hooking up with a hot chick in London he quickly abandons after fucking her once. He then goes and steals someone's surfboard. Keep in mind that those cost like a hundred bucks. We then see him having dinner on top of the Sphinx, sitting around having a good time not giving a damn about all the people whose lives he's ruined. See, when I first saw this movie, I saw this scene and thought, this was an interesting starting point. This, like in the original Spider-Man movie, for example, that you would start your character off as a selfish douchebag, and then you would have him grow and change and realize that he should use his powers for the good of mankind. Yeah, that never happens in Jumper. But who should show up right now but our villain to throw a wrench in David's perfect little depraved life? And who are you? My name's Roland. What are you doing in my apartment? Oh, we'll get to that. Anybody can rob a bank. What I'd like to know is how you rob a bank without opening any doors. And I know what you are. This conversation's over. Don't kill me. It's kinda hard to jump with a thousand volts of electricity passing through your brain, huh? You think you could go on like this forever? Living like this with no consequences? Hmm? There are always consequences. Yep, the guy who wants David to have actual consequences for his crimes is the villain of this movie. In a movie not made by Amaral fucktards, this guy would be the hero. David manages to escape his attacker, and he heads back to his old house. David! David! Thank you! David! David! David. I, I don't know if I'm going crazy here or not. You're not crazy. God, it feels so bad for this guy. Now that David is a fugitive, he decides for some reason now is the time to reconnect with his old high school crush, who has grown up from a bland Anna Sophia Robb to an even blander Rachel Bilson. Because connecting with her any time in the previous eight years would have made too much sense. Better to wait till someone's trying to kill you first. David. Doi. Hi. You were gonna leave without saying anything? Uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't see you. No? Were you just up there staring at me for the past 45 minutes? Please don't look at me like that. Why uh not? -huh. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Sorry, milady. Yeah, David. Why didn't you say something, huh? I think you're drunk. <laughs> So now the guy that just a day earlier abandoned a woman right after sleeping with her is now going to use his powers to defend a woman's honor. Guess I don't know my own strength. What follows is love dialogue even more boring and unconvincing than the other romantic part Hayne Christensen is most known for. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> we skip this boring stuff. Because if we did that, the movie might actually be watchable. You had those lists, right? And, I don't know, you were going to go travel the world. And... Was uh, thinking of maybe checking out Rome, actually. You were thinking of checking out Rome? Come on, you know that was my dream. Don't try to rip me off, okay? So come with me. So come with you? You're asking me to go to Rome? I mean, only if you want to skip the boring parts. Oh yeah, so if you randomly run into a woman you haven't seen in years, she's just going to go to Rome with you the next day. Look, I know Hayden Christensen is a handsome dude, but I don't think it would be that easy. And the next day, she actually goes with him to Rome. So but now, after flying to the other side of the planet with David, she finally starts to question him. I think there's something you're not telling me. No shit, Sherlock. Were you unconscious during the entire plane flight, packing, and airport security? What do you mean? This room. First class. I told you, I'm in banking. Banking. See, I know that you flunked algebra. But Millie is so turned on by his lack of personality and vague, undescriptive answers, they quickly start fucking like rabbits on Viagra. 
To be fair, I did edit out the part where David put on some Axe body spray and Old Spice deodorant. <laughs> After sneaking into the Coliseum, David meets another jumper named Griffin. Did you think you were the only one? Who dispatches more of the quote unquote bad guys who try to kill him. these people. Paladins. Paladins kill jumpers. Uncle Paladins. Class dismissed. Wait. The rest of the movie is pretty much just a montage of David and Griffin jumping all over the place while the bad guys try to find him, with nothing really being discovered or learned whatsoever. So if you'd like to kindly fuck off, as in now. Griffin isn't any more likable than David. If this movie was even trying to be a movie with any kind of point, Griffin might actually teach David something about uh, responsibility, or possibly give him some insights into the motivation of the villains, or possibly origins to his powers. Nope, we don't get anything like that from this guy. He's just another jumping dick. David jumps back to Rome to get Millie, but is quickly arrested for trespassing at the Colosseum. While Millie tries to deal with an Italian officer in this movie's incredibly unfunny attempt at comic relief, now you sit, or we sit you. David gets a visit from somebody important. You've only got about 30 seconds before they come through that door. Do you understand? You have to get out of here. Ditch the girl. She's with you. She's dead. Mom. But Diane Mom. Lane does what any sensible person would do if they were caught dead in this movie. Tries to get the hell out of it. David escapes by, get this, using his powers to strand a completely random and innocent police officer on top of the Sphinx. David could have escaped just as easily if he had teleported this guy only a couple blocks away. But no, he teleports him on top of the Sphinx, where he will likely fall to his death off screen. Nice. David breaks out Millie and sends her home, but not before his dear old dad gets a visit from a very unpleasant fellow. William Rice? Yeah. I don't have to ask. That's a courtesy. If I hear anything, I'll be sure to give you a holler. No, you won't. No, I won't. David makes a sudden and completely out of character decision to give a damn about someone other than himself and goes back to his father's old house. Now the movie actually tries to have an emotional moment when David finds his dead father and emotionally grieves over his body. It's good to see how much he cared about a guy who he abandoned for eight years for absolutely no reason whatsoever. David conducts an interrogation of his old high school bully and demonstrates his short-term memory loss. Stay the hell away from me! Just answer the question, or I'll drop you off the top of Mount Everest, okay? What? What did you what? tell him? Did you tell him about Millie? You told him everything. Why? Why did you do that? Uh, gee, David, I don't know. I guess I don't know my own strength. Did David genuinely forget about that? Or is he such a narcissistic scumbag that he can't even comprehend the notion that someone could be legitimately mad at him? David jumps on over to Griffin's hideout and proposes becoming a type of jumping Avengers. I was thinking that if we do this together, we could get him. What do you mean like you and me? You, uh, every Marvel team up. Yeah, I read it. Um, Two superheroes joining forces for like a uh, limited run. Because while Marvel superheroes operate under the philosophy that with great power comes great responsibility, you, David, operate under the philosophy that with great power comes screwing over the world and stealing lots of money. David and Griffin's reign of terror takes them to Tokyo, where they decide to go carjacking, even though they have no need for transportation. What's next? Are these two awesome heroes going to jump some puppies into a volcano to show how cool they are? This thing must be two tons easy. How are you, uh... If it moves, I can jump it. Actually, I knew this jumper once. Crazy bastard. Try to hop a whole building. <laughs> Want me trying that again? What's that? It's because he's dead. Killed him. Still managed to shake it a little up. Remember, jumping a building is fatal. 
That is a rule this movie just established. Remember that for later. Worried the paladin's my targeter, David jumps on over to Millie's house. But Millie's understandably peeved at him, though it's kind of hard to tell through Rachel Bilson's terrible acting. What the hell are you doing here? I buzzed, but you didn't pick up. So you just broke in? Uh, yeah, well, I needed to make sure that you were okay. No, David, I'm not okay. I got left in an airport in Rome. I think you should leave. David reveals to her his powers and jumps her to Griffin's place for her protection. I'm gonna explain this, alright? I'm gonna explain everything. Here. But it does no good because apparently the paladins can follow them with their handy dandy machine. Can't you guys just jump to the other side of the planet right now? Why are you hiding behind walls? Thanks for leading me to your friend. Wait, 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 wait! Why are you doing this to me? I never hurt you. I'm not hurting anybody. There's that short-term memory loss again. Remember this? Or especially this. Seems like you have a pretty high body count for a guy who never hurt anybody. Unlike David, Griffin does not go down like a bitch and proves a much more effective fighter than David. David needs Millie to cut him out of his binds, and afterwards they share this heartwarming piece of dialogue. Okay. I'll take you. I'll leave you alone. It was always you, though. Ever since we were five. It was always you. Wait, when did it ever mention that he knew Millie since she was five? And if it was always you, why'd you wait eight years while doing nothing and come back... Right after the paladin started trying to murder you, well, you know, whatever, I'm, I should stop trying to find any logic out of this thing. The paladin succeed at kidnapping Millie and plan to use her as bait to lure David to his death. Now they have to come to us. David and Griffin have a little bit of a couple spat of whether to blow up the paladins with a giant bomb. The in there with this whole army. I'm gonna go back there and end this, what do you think? Yeah, I'm gonna blow them the Timbuk too. Millie's in there. Well, yeah, there is that as well, but... I gotta go, I gotta go get her. We have to get her out of there! I can hear you! I'm not deaf. I understand what you're saying. I can actually hear. All right, well, it's a crying shame. It really is. But you know what? We all have to make sacrifices once in a while. Wait, Griffin wants to blow Millie up now? Wow, what a jerk. I guess that's this movie's strategy to make David look better by surrounding him with people who are even worse than he is. What the filmmakers didn't count on is that I'm fully capable of disliking both these assholes. <laughs> Their little disagreement about whether or not to brutally murder an innocent woman causes them to jump all over the world in a fight over the bomb's detonator. Wait, their powers are teleportation, not invulnerability. So getting a car dropped on you like that would be pretty lethal. David wins the fight by pushing Griffin into some electric cables. You hear me? You can't win! Get me down, Janet! You do this alone, and you're dead! David goes back to rescue the girl, but in doing so, just gets caught up in some electric cables. So you'd think David is doomed, right? No, because somehow, David manages to not only jump himself, but the entire frigging room. You established a couple of things, movie. First, that jumpers can't jump when they have a lot of electricity pulsing through their bodies. And two, that jumping an entire building is lethal. You can't just change your rules whenever you feel like it. I know this is a fantasy movie and it's free to invent whatever rules it wants, but you have to stick with them.
David, now that he has the upper hand, decides to dispatch Roland by jumping him to the middle of nowhere. I told you I'm different. Could have dropped you with the sharks. Yeah, leaving a guy to starve and thirst to death in the heat is so much nicer. You're a saint, David. But with the paladins defeated, there's still one more horror left for David to face. That's a great way for Hayden Christensen to seem like a better actor than he actually is, by surrounding himself with female leads who are even worse than he is. Hey, Mom? David has a conversation with his mother, who he finds out abandoned him because she knew he was a jumper, and some other information is given to set up a sequel that never happened. So it's true. You're one of them? Yes, it's true. We're five years old, your first jump. I only had two choices. Kill you, or leave you. So you left. But who's out there waiting for David except Millie, who decides okay? to stick with David for his cool powers even though he spent the entire movie lying to her and putting sure. her in needless danger for no reason. Where do you want to go? Surprise. So that was Jumper, and I gotta tell you, this movie is disgusting. Jumper is repulsive from beginning to end. It lacks anything resembling a likable character, and seems to be more like a wish-fulfillment fantasy movie for selfish douchebags. The concept is an interesting one, and one in better hands could have been an interesting character study in power and its moral applications, but if that's what it is, its conclusions are that you should use your power to steal, sleep around, and cause massive damage to the world around you. Even ignoring that, the movie is still crap. The villain's motivation makes no sense whatsoever, its fantasy rules are inconsistent, its story is completely pointless, and its acting is terrible to say the least. Jumper makes me feel more than a little ill. This movie makes me want to tell upon Owen over to Antarctica. I hear it's got good weather this time of year. I'm some loudmouth on the internet, and you just heard my opinion.